Get down now! Get down now! Go, move him! Yeah, knife in the back! Knife in the back! Stay right there! Stay right over now! Over the Knife behind her. Is there a victim in the car? Haunted by a tumultuous past, a mother of three goes on an unthinkably brutal rampage. Not even she can comprehend the sheer evil unleashed upon those who she claimed to have loved the most. My girlfriend just called me and said that, uh, said that some people in the house may be hurt. Do you know why? I'm not entirely certain. And she just hung up on you? Yeah, she didn't. She didn't sound good, and then I lost her. It's too late. It's already done. My three kids are dead. I don't know what happened. I really don't. I can't believe I could do that to my baby. I can't. And I know they're not alive, I know they're not. But as the twisted details of a family's buried secrets begin to surface, a shocking motive derived from jealousy and betrayal is brought to light, while the community is left shattered by the utter devastation. Residing in the highly populated city of Palm Bay, Florida, was a family of five, consisting of 33-year-old Jessica McCarty, her children from a previous relationship, seven-year-old Lacey McCarty, six-year-old Philip McCarty, Jessica's boyfriend Christopher Swist, and their shared five-month-old son, also named Christopher. The couple began dating a little over two years prior, after Jessica and her husband Philip McCarty separated in 2012. Chris, Jessica, and the children had only been living in the Kenmore Street neighborhood a short eight months, where they enjoyed the friendly community. As reported by their neighbors, Jessica could always be seen about the area taking walks with her children, and Lacey and Philip would occasionally play in the front yard. Chris also took over as a coach to the children's Little League baseball team, where it seemed they became even closer. Jessica was a recent stay-at-home mom following the birth of Christopher, after previously working in the medical field. Chris worked as a quality assurance manager at My Safe Home Inspection. Following his military service, he struggled with post-traumatic stress disorder, leaving him unable to drive, but Jessica was more than willing to take over the responsibility. The family was happy, or so it seemed, but no one really knew of the twisted reality lurking behind the scenes. It was another typical Friday morning, that March 20th of 2015, when the family awoke around 6.40. Lacey and Philip were ecstatic, as they had reached their last day of school before spring break and had plans of a beach vacation with their grandparents. Jessica had endured another sleepless night with the infant, but made sure that everyone was ready and out the door by 7.45. First, she drove Lacey and Philip to Discovery Elementary School, then took Christopher to his workplace. Later, her mother Patricia Knoll came over to her house. There, baby Christopher and his grandmother spent time together while Jessica completed a certificate for food stamps online. A couple of hours later, her mother would leave and Jessica would perform her usual chores. However, there was one thing on her to-do list that no one could have seen coming, something that cast a dark cloud over the once sunny community, and it all started with a phone call to Christopher from none other than Jessica. The time was 5.53 p.m. Chris, his brother Matthew Swist, and their mother Cheryl Swist had just arrived at Fired Up Pizza to have dinner. The outing was only recently planned by Matthew, who picked Chris up from work, and the two met Cheryl at the establishment. But the dining experience was cut short by the disturbing phone call. Chris answered Jessica's call, but what she said was no typical conversation starter. In a haunting voice, she told him, the kids are dead. Chris quite literally didn't believe a single word, and told her that she had to have been lying before proceeding to hang up. But two minutes later, Chris was convinced that something absolutely terrible had taken place. At 5.55 p.m., Jessica messaged him a picture of their kitchen floor stained with blood. Little did he know that this was only a sliver of the inconceivable horror that had taken place within the home. 911, what's the location of your emergency? My location is... Okay, what's going on? I'm not entirely certain. My girlfriend just called me and said that uh, 
kind of some people in the house may be hurt. Do you know why? I'm not entirely certain. And she just hung up on you? Yeah, she didn't. She didn't sound good, and then I lost her. And I figured rather than call her back, um, because I got a photo as well. What was the photo? Uh, it, was, it kind of looks like there's blood on the kitchen floor. Not a lot of it. Are your children? Not. Are your children now? Yep. That's normal. That's normal. Yes, I have uh, two small children and a new thing. Chris's mother frantically drives the two toward his home. Around 6 p.m., Jessica also makes a call to 911, indicating that she's in possession of a firearm, stating that she isn't afraid to use it. Chillingly, she tells the dispatcher, It's too late. It's already done. My three kids are dead. Upon Chris's arrival, he immediately rushes inside, where he finds a bloody Jessica in the living room holding a butcher's knife. He quickly disarms the blade and demands to know where the children are. Before she can answer, he is overcome with a wave of terror as he sees Philip's body laying between the love seat and the couch, covered by a blanket. Chris makes his way throughout the house in search of his own child, who he finds to be in the same horrendous condition. Laying on the left side of the master bed is five-month-old Christopher, also with a blanket draped over his body. In addition, there's a pink charging cord wrapped around his neck. Beside him is seven-year-old Lacey, who has also been covered. It appears that her entire body has just been submerged in water. Her blue lips and pale skin indicate that she may have been drowned. Despite their unconsciousness, the children are barely holding on to life. In a panicked state, Chris unwraps the cord from his infant's neck and rushes him outside, where he attempts to perform CPR. He dials 911, once again informing the dispatcher of the heartbreaking situation. It isn't long before police arrive, and a distraught Jessica is the first to encounter them. Get down now! Get down now! Go, move in! Got a knife in the back! Knife in the back! Stay right there! Stay right over now! Over now! Knife behind her. Not only does Jessica have a kitchen knife in hand, but a second one hidden in her waistband. Using a beanbag shotgun, the police are able to subdue her and seize the knives. Is there a victim in the car? Sprinting through the front door, an officer makes their way to Philip, where it's discovered that he also has a charging cord wrapped around his neck. The officer removes the cord and begins CPR. However, the child is not responding. Additional officers discover Lacey in the master bedroom, where they attempt to resuscitate the young girl, but she is also unresponsive. In the front yard, authorities attempt to revive Chris's infant son, and soon, all three children are rushed to the hospital. Jessica is in immediate need of medical attention. So if you want to swap with me since I got gloves, take that. Roll her to her side. Roll on your left side. Roll to your side. Authorities are desperately trying to bandage the wounds to Jessica's wrists and neck before they can transport her to the hospital. As police begin to search the house, they find what can only be described as something straight out of a horror movie. Bloodstains coat the entirety of the living room, while the main menu for the movie Marley and Me plays eerily on the TV. Frozen in time, the once happy place for a family to gather has now been transformed into a terrifying nightmare. Police find the kitchen in the same shocking state. This is where Jessica had taken an alarming picture of the floor, sending it to her boyfriend to convince him of the unbelievable truth. In addition, authorities locate blood on the kitchen table, as well as the cabinets and dishwasher, and into various drawers, along with the butcher's block. While the first bathroom of the house appears untouched, the next is catastrophically different. The shower's enclosure frame looks as though it's been slammed to the ground, while shards of glass are scoured throughout the scene. Although what prompts the most concern is the bathtub filled with water, while the faucet continues to run. Next, the officers search Christopher's room, where they notice a trail of blood leading directly to the crib. However, as authorities make their way outside, they uncover something unbelievable. A shocking piece of evidence is located on the dashboard of Jessica's vehicle, 
a chilling note indicating that she had every intention of committing the monstrous deeds. You'll soon hear the disturbing secrets lurking behind every word that could only have come from a truly deranged mind. All the while, Jessica, along with her children, were being rushed to the hospital. Both Lacey and her mother were transported to Holmes Regional Medical Center, where the child's life would come to a tragic end at 7.05 p.m. Philip and Christopher were taken to Palm Bay Community Hospital. However, it was soon determined that the two boys would be transferred to Florida Hospital for Children. While en route, Philip suddenly went into cardiac arrest and was immediately driven to Wustoff Hospital, where he passed away at 11.22 p.m. Baby Christopher was the only child left fighting. I don't know what happened. I really don't. I can't believe I could do that to my own baby. I can't. And I know they're not alive. I know they're not. I feel so bad. I have to find out a way to just live. I'm going to pray to God to please take me, please. Please. An autopsy would later reveal that seven-year-old Lacey sustained bruises to her feet and the left side of her abdomen, along with lacerations to her knees, feet, and right eye. In addition, three scratches on both sides of her neck indicated that she was desperately trying to resist something from being placed around her. Lacey's causes of death were determined to be drowning and manual strangulation. Six-year-old Philip had visible ligature marks around his neck, with no other signs of injury. The conclusive manner of death would ultimately be ligature strangulation. Christopher remained in critical condition. The sheer devastation brought about one burning question. How could a parent take the lives of their own children? According to family and friends, Jessica was a very devoted mother. However, there had been a darker side that no one was able to see until it was too late. We'll hear it now firsthand from the mouth of a killer as detectives try to make sense of the tragedy. Do you feel better than what you was feeling downstairs? No. No? Are you in pain? I'm in pain and I'm unbelievably distraught and upset. The detective proceeds to read Jessica her Miranda rights and she agrees to speak with them. Has there been any problems in your, in your relationship with uh, Christopher recently? Yeah. Okay. Tell me about that. When did that start? Um, it's kind of an ongoing. For months, for... He's in the Marines, went through a whole bunch of stuff, and has PTSD now, and... kind of thinks that I sit in the house and sleep all day and don't do anything, and that's far from the truth, and he loves to just go for the jugular when he makes, you know, those comments. Does anything can to hurt me. Apparently, the pair had been having relationship troubles for quite some time, and it will soon be revealed just how turbulent these issues were. For now, Jessica briefly explains the timeline of events that occurred from the night before and into Friday. She states that the family returned home in the evening from Lacey and Phillips' Little League baseball game, and the children were fast asleep by 8.45. However, this wouldn't be the end of the night for Jessica and Chris, seeing as a fight had suddenly emerged between the two. As the investigation unfolds, we'll discover the truth behind the lovers' quarrel. I'm sorry that this is coming back to me in different pieces. Because I cannot stop thinking about my kids. Okay. Last night, he told me he didn't want to be with me anymore. Christopher told you that last night? Yeah. So, so did you guys have an argument before going to bed? It wasn't really an argument. It okay. was a discussion. And I just wanted to know why. Why do you tell me why we've been together for so long? And day after day, you tell me you love me and how much how I'm your world. And you love what we have, but you don't see us having a future. Was there anything that led up to him telling you he didn't want to see you no more? I mean, do he... So he blames it all on me. So is this an argument that's been... Is this, uh, I guess, an argument that's been going on for days? 
Longer than that. Longer than that. Yeah. So has he told you before in the past that he didn't want to be with you anymore? Mm-hmm. Okay. Jessica wanted so desperately for the relationship to work, but Chris was apprehensive and for good reason. So it seems that you still cared for him. You still was in I love with him. love him more than anything in the world. And he does not feel the same. We learn more as she continues with the interview. She goes on to discuss their most recent dispute that occurred earlier Friday afternoon on the phone, where Chris informed her that he made plans to play baseball that night. However, Jessica wasn't pleased with the idea. She had plans with a friend and needed Chris to watch the kids. Following the call, further words were exchanged via text message, indicating that the disagreement was far from over. Chris wrote, Why were you yelling when you hung up the phone? To which Jessica responded, Maybe because I'm destroyed, my heart is broken in a million pieces, and the person I'm in love with hates me. He's saying he wants to go out? Yeah. Okay. He, oh, and then he said, Well, you know what? You can leave the baby. I'll come home. You can leave the baby. But the kids can't stay here. You mean the two older ones that's not his? Mm-hmm. How did that make you feel? Oh, well. The pair continued to text, and Chris stated, I really do desperately need a break from everything. I'm good hanging at the house with Christopher tonight. Jessica responded with, whatever you say. Chris then attempted to defuse the situation. Let's just try to have a fun weekend and see what happens. However, Jessica told him that she canceled her plans for the night, and the argument intensified. You go out with Matt and play baseball and everything. That's fine by me. I wanted to do one thing. I have no friends. Jessica stated, to which Chris responded, Any other night, go out. Where did you get money from to go drinking? After all that's been said, did you really expect me to hand you $60 and babysit your kids? The next time that Chris and Jessica spoke was her chilling phone call. And let me just make it very clear what happened today and how I did what I did to her. I didn't do it because of anything he said. I don't know what happened to me. I don't even remember doing it. I'm still in shock. So tell me what you did to the kids that you remember. And let's start with... I don't remember. I I don't remember. Did you recall seeing them hurt inside the house? Let's go there. I remember... PJ laying on the floor. And which one is PJ is going to be? Philip. It's Philip. Call him PJ. Okay. So Philip was laying on the floor. And then I remember when Chris got there, I saw him carry the baby out of the house. Where did uh, Chris carry the baby from? The bedroom. My bedroom. Okay. I may not have even seen the two, Lacey and the baby, when I called Chris. I may have just seen PJ on the floor, and that's when I called him, and he's like, yeah, right, and he hung up on me. Okay. And I sent him a picture of all the blood. Okay. And when you saw PJ on the floor, why is it that it appeared to you that he was dead? Because he wasn't moving. Okay. Did you touch him? Did you try to wake him? Yeah. Okay. Well, tell, me about, tell me about that. What did you do? I moved him, and he didn't do anything. Jessica states that she didn't attempt to perform CPR on Philip. So after you called Christopher and told him the kids are dead, that's when you discovered the other two in the room? I just knew, I had a feeling all along that they were dead. I didn't want to go and look again. I didn't want to see it. Okay, but did you go into the room, though, to see them, if they was in there? I know they were in there. I put them in there. Okay. When did you put them in there? Before? Were they alive when when you put them in there? Obviously, they were if the baby saw the pulse. Okay. What did you do to them before putting them into the bed? The baby. Let's start with the baby. What did you do to the baby? I don't even know. Do you remember seeing a telephone uh, charger cord. Did you use that on the baby? Do you remember? No. Oh, okay. Do you remember hurting the baby? I love him so much. I could never imagine hurting him. He's the happiest baby in the whole wide world. Okay. 
I don't know how this happened. Okay. I don't. I don't even know how. Okay, do you remember? I don't know I can shake it out to something like that. Why do you think you did it? I don't know. I've been having such yeah, problems. Okay, do you believe do you believe that you're the one that injured the kids? I don't know. I mean there was nobody else in the house, right? Yeah. Okay. But if I can't I mean, I guess so. I mean I can't I can't remember all of it and I know it's probably because I'm trying not to. Okay. Do you remember at some point, do you know if you drowned any of the kids? I don't think so. Did you put any of them underwater? No. Okay, do you know if you strangled any of the kids? I don't know. Okay. Do you think you stabbed any of the kids with the knife you was holding? No, I don't think so. As it turned out, Jessica was fighting her own demons, conjured up by a rocky past. According to police documents, she had previously struggled with a substance abuse problem and had a history of run-ins with the law. Jessica's mother, Patricia, provides detectives with specifics. First of all, is she diagnosed with anything mentally that you know of? You know, I know she's seen different psychiatrists, but um, I don't, an official diagnosis, I don't know. She okay. was diagnosed bipolar. Uh, they had said they, they suspected bipolar. I don't know if they ever confirmed it. Though we don't know if Jessica was formally diagnosed with either of these disorders, Individuals with borderline personality disorder are often mistakenly diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but the two are very different. In bipolar disorder, the affected person experiences episodes of mania and sometimes depression. However, in between episodes, they can typically function well or at least demonstrate an improvement in mood and behaviors. People with borderline personality disorder don't have episodes of illness. The emotions and behaviors they display are more continuous because the issues are a part of the individual's personality. I never thought she was bipolar myself. And she like she didn't act the typical bipolar. It wasn't manic depressive. Mm -hmm. She was sometimes she'd be fine, then all of a sudden she'd be like depressed. Yeah. It's just sad. Yeah. This indicates that Jessica never displayed manic episodes, and her unstable mood could be a result of borderline personality disorder. Do you know what would trigger those emotions? Mm, not really. I guess when things weren't going right in her life, if she had a fight with someone at work or if she had an argument with her boyfriend or her husband, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Nothing in particular. What about drug use? Did she ever have a history of drug use? Yes, okay, tell me about that. Um, I guess she was incarcerated for like three months. How long ago? She was ago? addicted to Xanax for a while, and then oxycodone was the... She worked for a doctor's office. This was um, a year ago, December, when she got out. She was in for three months. In December? This was in December? A year ago, December. And the kids lived with us at that time okay. while she was away for three months. Okay. No. Was she still in scripts and stuff? That's what, that's she, what she gets. That's what she gets. Um, Convicted of stealing. Yeah. She did steal a script pad from the doctor's office that she worked in yeah. and filled them illegally. Okay. And was taking them and selling them, I guess. I don't know for sure. Okay. Jessica's history of substance use and the resulting legal issues can be typical of individuals with borderline personality disorder due to the impulsivity that is characteristic of the disorder. And not only that, but according to Philip, Jessica's estranged husband, she had also stolen a credit card from a fellow employee during their marriage, using it to make fraudulent purchases at a Target. She was eventually caught by law enforcement and banned from the establishment. Did after after she had the kids, she I um, they're saying after this last baby, she was having like a postpartum depression. Did well, they, did it ever get worse? That just after they having the baby or with the other two, she was fine. She never had any problems after the baby. With this baby, um, there was. A complications with the birth and she still has it she's not healed yet it's five months and the incision that was made she had a c-section the incision that was made when she was leaving the hospital that day the whole incision opened up entire incision opened up and they told her that there was nothing they could do her doctor was out of town and they sent her home like that mm -hmm. and it got all infected and she was in the hospital for like over the next three months, probably 21 days, back in the hospital, seven infection, back 
And she was so depressed because she couldn't take care of the baby. She was always exhausted. And it all started with that uh, C-section. <laughs> but as far as postpartum, it wasn't because of the baby. Yeah, I just, feel it was because of the complications. complications. Yeah, <laughs> she loved that baby so much. She was a wonderful mother. She really was. But this wouldn't be the only sign of someone who was in desperate need of help. Jessica was eventually sent to Circle of Care, a mental health agency. But as the investigation continues, authorities will learn that Jessica may have had sickening thoughts of wanting to hurt others for a very long time. Okay. I just snapped and I'm very impulsive like that. Those with borderline personality disorder are well known for their impulsive actions poor anger control, and frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. Although individuals with this disorder can become suddenly angry and act on impulse, the disorder is not typically associated with committing acts of serious violence or murder. I've been in and out of circles of care and loose stuff and different therapies. Are you diagnosed mentally with anything? Yeah, bipolar. I'm sure I have post-traumatic stress disorder. I have PTSD. I was why so I, I mean, I can't even tell you. Do you take medication for that? No. Okay. If you did hurt the kids today, what led to that? What was, what happened today that led to that? Was it was it was it a conversation you had, you were having with, with with Christopher? Were he saying he doesn't want your kids at the house tonight? What was it? Was the kids yelling and screaming in the house? Were they were they were they misbehaving? They were being good. They were being the kids were being good. They're always good. Do you believe that you're the one that hurt the kids? I don't know. Well, think about it because things that you're telling us can, it's also information you can, you can relate to the doctors, which can probably help them if we know what happened to them. Right. Okay. So I'm trying to find out what did you do to them because we need something we need to tell the doctors so they know how to care for them. The detective pleads with Jessica to recall every last detail of the distressing events but she simply cannot, or so she claims. Did you still have the knife in your hand when the police showed up? Yeah. Okay. Did they tell you to drop the knife? Yeah. Did you drop the knife? No. Why not? Because I want them to shoot me. Just try to relax. And I want you to try to help, try to remember as much as you can about what happened to the kids. I w will not. That's going to be something I'm going to erase from my memory forever. I can't. My daughter is dead. Well, let me ask you this. Well, let me ask you this, Jessica. Do you think the infant did it, Christopher, the little Christopher? Sure. You think Christopher? You talk to me like I'm a little. Well, the reason why I'm trying to talk to you, I'm trying to weed out the possibilities, and I'm trying to help you remember by saying things like this, because the only people that was in the house. You remember by talking to me condescendingly. Listen to me. The only people that was in the house was exactly was you me. and the kids. So obviously. I did it, and I don't know how I did it. And you don't know why. And I don't, I have no reason why. I love my children. They are my life. I wake up for them. I take care of them all day long. I put them to bed. I sleep with them at night once a week. I don't think you can find one person in this world who could say I'm a bad mom. You had the world on your shoulders. You had your husband at basically left you with the two kids. You had a new baby. The, the baby's dad is blaming you for, you know, not working, even though the baby's five months old. It, really, I mean... And that's a job itself. You had pro complications yeah, from a C-section. I mean, you had no support. And listen, having been there, done that, I'm not saying it's an excuse, but I can see where somebody would snap. And just buckle under all that weight. I, I can see it. They can be the best kids, but you know what? Kids are still kids. They still cry all night. They wrong. I know. And I killed Lacey. I do that. She was such a good girl. Jessica states that she never previously injured any of her children and wouldn't even think about it, although future revelations will prove this to be horribly untrue. You're swearing everything you're telling me is the truth? As far as I can remember. Okay. But, I mean, I'm doing my best to remember. Okay. Do you think after you have some rest, you might be able to remember more? I hope. I don't know. Can I come back tomorrow? I I, you can come back, but I don't want to remember. It 
it's common among individuals with borderline personality disorder to disconnect from reality or block painful memories and feelings from their minds. One of the primary symptoms of the disorder is severe dissociative symptoms. Dissociating is often how they learn to cope with thoughts and feelings that are difficult or painful. You talk about her a lot. Do you remember doing something specifically to her, to, to Lacey? Do you remember anything specifically you could have done to her? I remember talking to her on my bed, and she was scared, but I don't remember anything else. How do you know she was scared? Because I saw the look on her face. Okay. Were you holding the knife at that time? No. According to Jessica, throughout the ordeal, Lacey persistently told her mother of how much she loved her. Do you think if Christopher never told you, made that comment about your kids, about the two older kids, that he didn't want them at the house, uh, do you think uh, this never would have happened? Absolutely, because then I wouldn't have been home. Because what? I wouldn't have been home. Mm. But that's not why I did it. It's not. I would never take that out on them. Then why do you think you did it? I don't know. No, you said you decided to call the police and tell them. Why, why was your first decision to call Chris and tell him that? I don't know. Did you want to hurt Chris? Make him upset? No. Why send him the picture of the blood? Because he didn't believe me. He's like, yeah, okay, and he hung up. What type of reaction were you expecting from him? I mean, what was it you were like, trying to get from him? Like, oh, my God, are you serious? I'll be right there. Not, yeah, okay, I'll talk to you later. I'm drinking. Sorry. Am I this crazy right now? Like, did I actually do this? Did I do this? Did I try to kill all my kids? Not what I tried to do. The detective concludes the interview by stating that Jessica should rest. They return to speak further the following day, March 21st. Yesterday when we came here, because she was in custody, I read your rights. Do you need me to read them to you again, or do you still know your rights? I know my rights. Okay. Do you, do you want to talk to us without a lawyer? No. You don't want to talk to us? I do, but I just can't. Why can't you? I mean, can you just clarify what you mean by that? Do you want to talk, but you can't? You can't. Or you mean you can't recall, or you can't talk? There's nothing more I can tell you today that I didn't tell you yesterday. Jessica agrees to proceed without a lawyer. The detective is eager to ask a critical question regarding the note found in her car. Do you remember when your mom came over? Yes. And she brought the kids over after school, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, how long did she stay when she came over? Not long. Oh, okay. Were you, um, do you remember like, like writing something in a journal while she was there? And she asked you what, what, what she was writing. Do you remember that? No. Okay, do you remember writing into a journal? No. It was typical of Patricia to pick the kids up from school once or twice a week, as she had on Friday, March 20th. However, when she arrived with the children, she quickly noticed that things weren't as usual. And when you arrived at Jessica's house, was anybody there with Jessica? Was she there by herself? By herself. Did you go inside the house? I did. Okay. Uh, tell me what happened when you arrived. Um, but the door was locked and she came and unlocked it. And then she went back, she was sitting in the recliner and she was writing in a notebook. Um, she so, was writing in a notebook? Yeah. What did it look like? It was just, right, I don't know what color the cover was because she had it open. Okay, just like, like a little journal thing? No, it was like a regular, like a school notebook. Yeah. Like spiral. yeah. And she was writing in there and she was just looking up at the TV and writing. And the kids were just sitting there watching TV. I said, Jess, what are you writing? And she said, I'm just writing some stuff down. I said, oh. I said, it looks like you're writing a letter. You're writing a letter? And she said, yeah, kind of. And I said, well, who are you writing a letter to? She said, no, in particular. I said, can I read it? And she said, no, you can't read it. And she kind of left. Sadly, the note that Jessica had been writing would turn out to be the same one that police found on the dashboard of her car. And not only would the heartbreaking content send authorities down a spiraling staircase of questions, but it would also serve as a background to a possible motive. Besides her writing in a notebook, you notice any uh, behaviors with her that looked like she was getting stressed she was out? Not stressed out. She was. She seemed like sad. She seemed Depressed. sad. Is she? But not like you know. Not. I would just say, just you know, do you want me to take the kids home? I said to her, do you want me to take them home, and then you can get done what you got to do. 
She said, no. I said, well, if Chris is not coming home, why don't you let me take the kids and you just have the baby, you can finish your laundry, whatever. And she said, well, to tell you the truth, I'd rather you left the kids here because they'll keep me company. The timing of Jessica writing this note indicates that there was planning involved. This allowed her to imagine the atrocity of killing her three children, suggesting that her actions may not have been impulsive after all. Okay, so you leave. Um, when is the next time you hear from uh, Jessica? About quarter to six, she called me. Okay, can you tell me the nature of the call? I just answered the phone and she said, Mom, I've just called to tell you I'm very sorry. I said, what are you sorry for? She said, because of what I did. I said, she's a devil. She said, I killed the children. I said, no, you didn't. She said, I did. I said, you did not. I, I screamed at her, you did not. And she said, I did. I did. I all three of them I killed. And I started screaming for my husband. It was in my bed. They know which thing she would have done this. No. What's that? no one would have thought she would have done that. Of course not. Yeah. If I thought she was even anything like that, I never would have left those children. Yeah. No. And we all know And that. she wasn't like, she was very calm. She wasn't distraught. She wasn't screaming, yelling, of, you know. She was just there. And she just said, Mom, I don't really feel like talking, so I'll call you later. I said, and I just kissed them goodbye. And although Patricia can recall the course of events for that day, Jessica is unable to do the same. I have a monster deep down inside, obviously, if I can do something like that. And we're just trying to get everybody to understand why, why it happened. My kids were my like, they were my absolute life. They were also my best friends. They don't have any friends. They were all I had. Mm -hmm. They were the only ones who loved me. Do you remember telling your mom that you... Felt like taking your kid's life. No. A couple of weeks ago. What no. About, what? Uh, what I did say was, I understand how certain parents do that. Do taking their kids' lives? Yes. Okay. I never said I would do it because I never, ever in a million years would have imagined that happening. Now you said you understand why some parents would do that. Explain to me why do you? How do you understand that? I, you know, I, I'm done answering questions. Okay. You have any questions for us? Do you have more questions about us? No. We go smart about my family. That's all. I talked to Philip yesterday. And how about that? Mm, not well. He, he was very upset. He never saw that many life, so. I understand it's horrible to lose a kid, but if you don't come around and you don't see your kids and you don't support your kids, mm. It shouldn't have been as hard on him as it was for everybody else. But then he feels a lot of guilt for not seeing him. Well, he should. Jessica is unable to provide any other useful information, and the interview quickly ends. However, the next day, on Sunday, March 22nd, five-month-old Christopher is pronounced dead at 7.12 p.m. due to ligature strangulation. On March 23rd, Jessica is provided a warrant for her DNA, as the authorities are hoping to distinguish her blood from anyone else's within the home. Jessica remains in a distorted state, as she still cannot believe that her three children are dead. She begins to break down and cry before proceeding with the cheek swab. However, the gut-wrenching case is far from over as the Palm Bay community mourns and searches for answers. There are still two individuals who we have yet to hear from, Jessica's estranged husband, Philip along with her boyfriend, Chris. Just four days after the harrowing ordeal, both are given a chance to sit down with authorities. A mountain of secrets will soon be revealed, shedding a whole new light on the investigation. We begin with Philip. Well, my, my, my job here is just to find the facts. Right. Now, I'm not here to crucify her right. or anything right. like that. We just want the facts... You know, we, we want yeah. mainly we want to do justice oh, sure. for the children. Yes, you know that, that yes. that's that's the only thing right here. And yes, how long had she exhibited like some mental issues, or she? Had? Uh, you know, I would say before the kids were born, I think she took sleeping pills or something. But I do remember when the kids are about. I'd say, God, I want to want to be kind of correct and make sure. Uh, I don't know, maybe four and three, maybe three, two, somewhere around there. I do I remember one time her telling me, because we were going through these times, and then I'm trying to 
tell her that everything's going to be okay. And and her going, no, I'm, I'm having these weird thoughts. These thoughts that shouldn't be in my mind. I was like, what do you mean weird thoughts? Because I think thought about it, killing the kids and These kinds of thoughts indicate that Jessica may have been suffering from postpartum depression. And since she was suffering from serious mental health issues and then experienced the impact of childbirth multiple times, she may have been suffering with it for years. Postpartum depression is a complex and not well understood diagnosis. Though symptoms are most commonly seen in the first few weeks after birth, they can occur any time within the first year. Emotional, behavioral, and cognitive changes may be caused, but it can also be accompanied by psychosis and other symptoms, including the diminished ability to think clearly, delusions or strange beliefs, feeling very irritated, paranoia and suspiciousness, and rapid mood swings. I was like, what? I, you know, I just shook my head. I said, what? I was like, you, you got to be kidding me, right? Mm-hmm. I was like, how, how could you? And you guys were still together? Yes, yeah, we were together then. That was years ago. You know, that was after our kids were born. I said, why would you even say that? I said, it's the love of your lives. I mean, I mean, they're all our love or our life. I mean, we did everything with our kids and mm-hmm. her family. You know, her family was like my family. It seems that Jessica was having these disturbing thoughts well before she actually acted on them. Only two weeks before that tragic day, Jim Knoll, Jessica's younger brother, had made his way to her home. He planned to confront her about unrelated issues that had supposedly caused a rift in the family. Supposedly, six-year-old Philip was in the room for the entire dispute. However, Jim claims that he and his sister ended the argument by having a heart-to-heart conversation and the dust seemed to have settled. Unfortunately, it appears that Jessica's dark thoughts were getting the best of her. Besides that, then it was, you know, she was a loving, caring mom. You know, she's always worried about the kids. You know, what, you know hopefully the just don't happen this, because she said Lacey here lately has been, you know, getting reports from home, from school saying that she was, you know, acting out in class or whatever, or not doing it. Or like she's spaced in their... So she was saying that she thought Lacey was, it looked like something that she went through when she was younger. I think she was or something. Who? Mm-hmm. Uh, Jessica. So before this all happened, what was the last time you saw her or, seen, or talked to her? I talked to her that day, 12, 12 15, 12 30, that okay, Friday yeah. evening. Or that afternoon? afternoon yes. That during the day? Yeah. What'd y'all talk about? Talked about, uh, she said that, uh, do you got my child support? I said, no. I said, I could probably have it to you by Saturday or Sunday. And she goes, well, that don't let, that ain't actually going to help me now. My water's about to be shut off and I need the money now. And I was like, well, I can't do nothing now. Following her separation from Philip in 2012, Jessica had apparently developed a substance problem leading to a drug conviction. This ultimately left her struggling to provide for her kids. She took a job as a fry cook at a Palm Bay bowling alley. In 2013, she apparently listed her income as $450 a month. According to Philip, he would try and give Jessica $100 to $200 a week to help with expenses. It wouldn't be long before she found herself in a new relationship with Chris. And then she started going, like, she usually does, calling me a piece of you know, crap and my voice, my dad, my... Kid was dead. You know, what, how much you say about somebody being dead? Yeah, my my baby. My oh, you baby. have a new baby. Yeah, I have a new baby also. Same she said she was your baby was dead. Yeah, yeah. Supposedly, Jessica would make these comments on a regular basis. According to the mother, Philip would see the kids every so often, but was reportedly never in their lives as much as Jessica wished. However, these claims have never been confirmed through friends or family. She would always manipulate everybody because I think they believe that. Because I'd call and, and some I know she did it on purpose. She wouldn't answer. It's likely that Jessica is a good liar. Hearing from Philip is making the detectives question everything Jessica told them, including how she supposedly doesn't remember murdering the children. Okay, yeah. wait, when you were talking to her Friday, oh, she. Friday. I mean, this was yes. Friday. Yes. She seemed. God, she seemed in her right mind, yeah, loose, she, that she wasn't acting. She, she seemed the exact like she used to. You know, always. You know, she was like, yeah, yeah, she was like, oh, you're a piece of crap. You know, but I hung up on her because I know what, I don't even want to sit there and argue with her. 
I wish I did see something or hear something. Or yeah. Even like Pat, she said she had kids. I wish she would have. That's but, her mom. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. Did. She said that she had. She, she saw acted. her the morning and the yes. afternoon. She said that Pat told me she just just told her that how lucky she was to have these three beautiful kids, and then here, you know, I get a call from Pat at six or Saturday or whatever time it was, and tell me Lacey was dead, not Bob. Did um did Jessica ever talk about Chris about what they were going through and no, everything? Or no, I didn't know any other problems. Anything like that. She never told me nothing. Yeah. Anything, nothing. But Chris and Jessica did, in fact, have problems of their own. Problems that some would say caused a monumental divide between the two. They seemed to have it all. A picture-perfect family and a new beginning. Yet there was a dark presence lurking in the shadows. During your two-year relationship with her, did you ever see any type of behaviors that made you think that she is that she does have a mental illness or anything like that? No, it's not. Okay. How was she with the kids? Un. Believably amazing. There's a lot of things you could say about her, but as far as being a mother, she was realistically the top three I've ever seen, only including her mom and my mom. Unreal how good she was with those children. Okay. There was nothing of any sort, nothing that she would not have done, always there. They wanted for nothing. It really. So she was a good provider. It's the reason I was with her. And I knew her children prior knowing her through. You know, the aunt and uncle, her, the kid's aunt and uncle, his parents, I, I knew them. And I fell in love with Lacey when she was about two and a half. And then I met Smash at the Super Bowl when the Giants won. You met who? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we, 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 is that PJ, the yeah, one they call PJ? PJ we, okay. well, we've always called him Smash. And like all relationships, the couple wasn't perfect and would occasionally argue over various topics. However, only a year prior, a tragic incident occurred, making Chris more than suspicious of his girlfriend. According to Cheryl, Chris's mother, Jessica had been posting about their family dog on Facebook, stating things along the lines of, does anybody want a dog? According to Jessica, she couldn't stand the animal. It didn't seem likely that it was all just a coincidence when the dog's mysterious death occurred shortly thereafter. Apparently, the dog was perfectly fine prior to its death, leading friends and family to suspect that Jessica may have had something to do with it. If this is true, it's a significant red flag that Jessica was capable of being violent and abusive toward those who were most vulnerable. And not only this, but there was another cause of friction between the two as the mother's postpartum depression following the birth of Christopher was weighing down on her every day. In a text message sent to Chris on March 10th, 2015, she wrote that the children were showing her no respect, to which she threatened to snap the kids' necks if they made another sound. And things would only get worse when she discovered that another woman may have caught the attention of the baby's father. Chris had always been known to be friendly. However, Jessica thought that he was a little too friendly with one of his co-workers, Brandy Buckley. A couple months prior to the incident, Jessica had supposedly discovered flirtatious messages between the two while scouring through her boyfriend's phone, although Brandy asserts that it was nothing but harmless flirting. The father reportedly confided in his co-worker, allegedly stating that he wished to leave Jessica, but remained in the relationship for the children's sake. Furious, Jessica apparently created fake numbers using multiple cellular applications to send threatening texts to Brandy, even allegedly stating at one point that she had enough evidence to show Brandy's husband. Chris apparently didn't believe that the messages were sent from Jessica when his co-worker notified him of the bizarre texts. The continuous threats forced Brandy to change her number. Jessica's anger towards the woman raged on. Recovered messages between Heather Rymiller, Chris's supervisor, and Jessica convey a snippet of Jessica's disdain. On February 25th, she wrote, Hey, pretty lady, listen, between me and you, please not a word to Chris or anyone, but if you decide to fire anyone or they leave, not sure if it's a possibility, but it would be amazing if you kept me in mind. She stated that she was eager to get back in the workforce, but she added one condition. And honestly, it would be so awesome if Brandy wasn't there. Heather politely informed her that she would be on the lookout for an opening, 
Although in an interview with detectives, she stated that she would never have hired Jessica as an employee, seeing as Chris already worked for the company. Less than a month later, Jessica texted her once again, but this time it was not about a job. At 3.07 p.m. on Thursday, March 19th, only one day before the heartbreaking ordeal, Jessica wrote to Heather, Would you be able to call me when you get a chance? Chris cannot know that I'm texting wanting to talk to you, but I can't hold it in anymore. It must be kept in strict confidence, please. If he finds out, I'm sure he'll leave me, but I don't like what's going on. Heather, understandably concerned, responded, Hey, sorry, I'm busy. I won't say anything to him. I feel a little uncomfortable because I don't know what to say. Jessica stated that she had information to give. However, Heather was apprehensive as she wrote, Are you okay? Because this is really weird and I can guess that it's about Chris because I'm not supposed to say anything, but you should probably talk to him. She ended the message with, But this is a little strange. Heather went on to ask if it was in regard to her company, and Jessica answered, kind of, yes. Eventually, the two hopped on a phone call where Jessica informed Heather of the supposed Facebook messages found on Chris's phone between him and Brandy. The two had allegedly called Heather an inappropriate name while discussing their problems with the supervisor. Heather wasn't thrilled to hear of the news. However, it seemed that Jessica wanted more than anything for the pair to be reprimanded. In addition, Heather told authorities that she could hear an argument between the couple that Friday morning as Jessica was dropping Chris off for work, although she didn't specify what they were arguing about. The night prior to the incident, a heated conflict had emerged between Jessica and Chris over Brandy. Seeing as the couple's washer and dryer had recently broken, Brandy was kind enough to temporarily lend them her own, although Jessica was unhappy with the arrangement. According to Cheryl, Chris's mother, Jessica had even gone so far as to send out a Facebook post claiming that the ones given to them by the co-worker had been inoperable. Furious at Chris, Jessica demanded that they buy a new set. The dispute supposedly escalated into a full-blown discussion regarding their relationship, where Chris asserts that they mutually brought up the idea of calling it quits. They agreed to reevaluate the topic at the end of the weekend, according to Chris. However, as Jessica went to bed that night, she may have known that moment would never come. So you didn't think she was being, you, you didn't think she was being honest when she said the kids are all day? You thought when, she, when she called me, I didn't think she was being honest. I didn't think there was a chance in the world. Right. Um, when she sent me the picture, it was enough to concern me because I thought worst case scenario, what? she lost her mind and killed one of my dogs. Never in my wildest imagination on my way there did I think the kids had actually been touched. I was expecting that the kids really went, all three were at the grandmother's and she was just f***ing with me. So when you when you went to the door, was the door locked? It wasn't locked, it was closed. It was closed, I had to turn the knob. It so was it was unlocked? unlocked. It was unlocked. unlocked. And, wh and where was she standing? Immediately to my left. How many feet in the house? Closer than me to you. Three? Three feet? So approximately three feet from the front door. Was she was she holding anything? Yeah, she was holding a giant butcher knife. Which hand was it in, if you remember? It was in her right, because thinking about it, I reached with my left in case I had a fucking in case I had to sit her down. Did you disarm the knife from her? Yeah, I grabbed it and I threw it across the floor. And what did and what did you do after that? I said, Where are the kids? Where are the being kids? Chris briefly explains the horror he encountered upon arrival at the home. So I'm carrying my buddy, I'm talking to him, I'm going outside, I go just run right past her and go out the front door. Mm -hmm. And wow, oh, yeah. she said to me, she goes, don't go out the front door. I was like, you're right, I don't want my mom to see this. My mom doesn't need So then I backtracked and ran back. And as she said that, you know, I'm thinking, okay, well, there's obviously somebody else. There's somebody in the laundry room, there's somebody in the garage who's going to stab me in the neck. So I switch over. I have Christopher on my left arm, and I run through, and there's nobody there. So you go through the garage? Yeah. The garage door was open when I came to the house, which is strange. So the garage door was open. So then I ran through, and I dove uh, to the passenger side of my truck. My truck was backed in. I dove to the uh, right side of it, blocking the view of my mom, and I started just pushing on him, just hoping for the best. Do you think you're Jessica suffering from a mental illness? Yes. 
Absolutely. Do you think the act that she did was because of the mental illness? Yes. Do you think it's malicious? Yes. It's something that I couldn't figure out at the time, but I hope to, I don't know if there's that technology that those phone calls that I received are recordable. I hope they are. She, it was not her. If you listen to her voice in real life and the voice that she had on that phone, it was not her. When I walked in that front door and I stared her in the eyes, it was not her. And at the same time, Jessica couldn't even recognize herself. However, in a most shocking and heartbreaking letter left behind by the mother, she writes directly to the ones she loves most, stating, To my family, I'm so sorry for what I had to do. I love you all more than life itself. I'm fully aware that this is much more painful for everyone I left behind. I had no other choice. Thank you for being the most amazing family. We are truly the luckiest in the world. Jessica goes on to write a portion of the letter specifically for Chris. Dear Chris, as I've said in the past, I love you more than life itself. I could never picture my life without you. You were a good dad to Christopher. Please keep his beautiful memory alive. I'm sorry I couldn't be like Brandy. I can't stand your infatuation with her, but maybe you two can have a happy life together. She continues on with the chilling words. I finally believe you when you say I'm not good enough. You hate Lacey, so I know you won't miss her. Please remember all the horrible and disrespectful things you said when you go for the jugular. Those words never leave me. In the final pages, Jessica cannot contain her feelings, writing, Well, you're right. I am worthless just like you tell me all the time. I can't live without my children. I also can't live with my whole family falling apart. Guess that's it for now. Hope to see you in the afterlife if I get there. I know the kids will. Good luck. Thanks for destroying our family. In December of 2015, Jessica pleaded guilty to three counts of first-degree murder, ultimately avoiding the death penalty, and will spend the rest of her life behind bars. To this day, however, no one can say for certain what led the mother to commit one of the most horrific crimes that the nation has ever seen.